hours, and we are talking about problem four uh, from the practice midterm one. And so the question is, when we look at this and we talk about static scoping and dynamic scoping, do we start at the top? Do we start at main? When do we start at things, right? That was the question. Um, so the basic, so the big difference, so you do the same things uh, initially, right? So execution is the same, right? So we know how the semantics of execution in a normal, normal program, right? You start at main, you start executing to the lines, and when you see a function call, you go execute that function. When that is a function call, you go execute that, and you go back, go up the call stack, right? I think that's that's pretty standard. So in both cases, the way you're doing the execution is exactly the same. The difference is when you construct the call stack, or the, um, sorry, the symbol table. So do you construct it statically beforehand, or do you construct it dynamically at runtime? And that's the two differences there between the names. So static, you're, do you're constructing the symbol table statically, versus dynamic, you're doing it dynamically. So it would help if I do a quick uh, example. Um, okay, so for this, so I'll just do a very simple example that's very that's uh, similar. Uh, so we have foo and i uh, g and where g, so I'm cheating here and not declaring things. using a nicer language than C, so I don't have to use a printf statement. And so I have main i equals 5. And what order do we want to do these in? Let's call g and then call f, maybe. OK. So statically, we can look and see that, so we can see that there's two declarations, right? So here's, here's the big difference. So we didn't really talk about it. We didn't talk about it, but statically, the big difference, so static, with static scoping, I build the symbol table, but I build it up statically as I go through and parse this function, this uh, program. So I start at the top, so I'm going through and I'm parsing and trying to understand the symbols. So I see there's a declaration of an integer i, so in my table, I create an integer i, um, and it doesn't have a value because I'm not executing it now. I'm, I'm just looking at declarations, right? I'm just statically going to the program. Now, I want to hint a little bit ahead towards future compiler optimizations. If the compiler knows that this is always a certain value, then it may be able to use that later on, but we we'll don't have to worry about that now. Um, so, and I know this scope is this whole thing, right? Then I go into this f and I start parsing this function f, and I see, oh, this is a new scope, so we're creating a new scope here. And I see that there's a declaration for an integer i. And so that way I know that this i right here that we're referencing maps to that declaration of i because I can look it up in my symbol table. I see, where's this symbol i declared? Oh, it's this same i that's declared here. So let's say each of these has a, like the location of the declaration. So that's how I know, oh, that i is that i and not the global i and I can know that statically. And then, so I'm just going through, let's say resolving the names of all these things in my symbol table, because I want to check to see if you're using a name before it was declared. So when I get out of here and I go outside of this block, now I get rid of that name, because it's out of scope, right? It no longer exists here. Then I go to G and I say, okay, G references some I. What I is this? Oh, I look it up in my symbol table, and I see, oh, all three of these i's all reference the same i up here, right, the global i. And so, okay, I know that's good, that's declared, so I know that's statically what it references. Uh, and then when we go here, nothing changes, nothing was declared here. And now here I look up the i in the static symbol table, and I see, oh, that's this i up here. And I also look up g and f, and I can see where they get called and everything. So I do that now before I start executing the program, and then boom, it's done. This never changes throughout program execution. So what I decided at compile time, or at static, when I'm statically analyzing this, uh, 
I know that this eye always refers to this eye, and specifically these eyes here always refer to that global eye and are never going to refer to anything else. Does that make sense? So we're not calling any functions because we're not executing anything. Exactly. We're not doing anything. We're not executing anything. We just want to statically determine that, yes, these names' uses are referring to these declarations. So we do this all statically. And then once it's done statically, then we start executing. And we say, OK, let's start executing from here. So boom. So now I set this to 5, which is this global value to 5. I go into G. G increments the global value to now 6. So we print out, we're going to print out 6. Uh, G returns. Then we go into F. We set this thing to be 10. We call G again. G increments. Now remember, this I is always same this I. I. Same I. So oh, only variables, same. not functions, are declared statically? Uh, so functions are also declared statically. Yeah. So because the big thing is we need to decide here when we see this call to G, we need to resolve this call to one of the G's that was defined previously. Now, I'm, I didn't technically define this one above this one because I wrote it by hand, right? So in C, this would be actually an error because statically we'd get to here, we'd see this name G, we'd look it up in our symbol table, and hmm, I only know about an I and an F. I don't know any names G. So that's definitely an error. Um, but I could fix that with like a, like a little declaration there. Um, okay, so I printed out 6. Now I got to here, set that to 10, called G. We're in G from this F. And now we're going to incrementing that to 7, which we did. And we're going to print out 7. Then we come back. And then we leave F. And then we leave me. Uh, so we printed out 6 and then 7. Make sense? Yeah. Questions on this? All right. Yeah. Yeah, so now dynamic scoping. Okay. All right, so in dynamic scoping, so there's kind of a couple ways. So the main way to think about it is we're resolving names at runtime while the program is executing them, we resolve the names using the dynamic symbol table at runtime. Right? So now essentially we're executing. So now we're not going through it first. We're going through it and executing it. So we go through here, we see a declaration for i. <coughs> so we create an i in the global in this scope, which scope is here. Then we go here, we we can just be really complete. We're gonna create a entry for G to say that there's some function G that's being created. Uh, we go in here to say there's some function F being created. Uh, do we execute F? No. No, so that's not how this is right? We start execution at the main function. But we're going through and seeing that, oh yeah, there exists a function F. There exists a function, ah, here's the definition of G. So here I'd probably have like, say, hey, this is the body of G and this is the body. Oops. Or the other way around. <laughs> you know it's faster it is to just change things. Alright. Great. So I'd get into there, and then I'd get into main, and I'd say, okay, this is where I start executing at. Aha, the main function, finally. Uh, okay, so start execution. So set i equals to 5. So I need to look up and say, well, what does this name resolve to? Alright, so I look it up here, and I see, oh, well, here's an i. Great. I'm going to set its value to be 5. Uh, then we're going to call g. And I'd be like, what is this name G, right? And so I'd look it up here and say, oh, this G refers to this function. So I actually know I can start executing here. Now I set I is equal to I plus 1. So I try to resolve these I's. What do they resolve to? Latest I. This one, right? Yeah, yeah this I up here in the global symbol table. Uh, so it's going to update that to 6. And then we're going to print it out. So we'll print out 6. And then G returns. Now we start executing F. So now we see a new declaration for a new integer in this scope. So now we're going to create a new entry in our, in our symbol table of i that doesn't have any scope, or that doesn't have any value yet. Uh, but we see this line, and so we're going to execute i. 
we're going to set i to be 10. Right? And so we know which i this refers to because we look it up in the table. We look it up bottom to top, and we see that i, and we see that that, okay, that's where I'm putting that 10. Then we call g, and once again, we would actually look up g in this dynamic scoping table to say, what, where does, where's the body of this function that I'm calling? And I'd see, oh, it's here. Boom. Okay, good. So I start executing here. So now I want to resolve this i. What do I, what is it, value does it resolve to? Let's say here. 10 plus 1. 10, yeah, so we're going to take 10 plus 1, add it to i, so this is going to be 11. We're going to print out 11. Uh, then g is going to return, and now f is going to return. And remember, this, this scope here that we created here is only valid inside this block. So we know once we leave it, we have to get rid of it and pop it off, essentially just get rid of that whole scope. So f returns, and when it does, this goes to. So if we were to, were to print out i here, we'd print out 6. Because that one's gone, it no longer basically exists. You said you look at the symbol table at the bottom of the top. That's what dynamic inside to. You always look at the Yes, table. yes, because that's how shadowing works. So that's why statically when you look here, when you want to resolve this i to a name, you look from the closest scope out. And so that's why I think like bottom up you're creating these scopes. So, yeah, each of these scopes is more, is closer to where you're either executing or analyzing if you're doing it statically. So here I'd say, ah, this i goes to this local i, which was defined here. Boom. Okay, so I know that result, that is refers to that i. Um, but once I get out of here, when I'm doing it statically, I get rid of that, and now these i's all refer to this global i. Makes sense. And then problem five number two. All right, problem five number two. Okay, yeah. So problem five is about the Pointer. code with the pointers and the yeah. Okay, so I'll draw like a simplified version of this on the board, and then we can talk about it. But I think it will include everything. Okay. Any questions on dynamic scoping? slightly because this isn't going to affect anything. Uh, in pointer B, and we're saying basically A is equal to malloc a new something that will hold the size of an integer. B, same thing. Then we set star A to be 42. Then we're gonna set we're gonna malloc more memory, put it in B. And then we do star B is equal to star A. And then we do P is equal to the address of A. Q is equal to the address of B. Okay, and what we want to know is problem one. Question one states basically uh, at this point, it's point one. This point is point two. Uh, so basically, draw all the circle box diagrams for point one. Draw all the circle box diagrams for point two. Uh, so every kind of does anyone want me to do this one? The point one. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to specifically ask for A and B. So the box. So first thing we know whenever we have a declaration. Right, we're binding that name A. So we have a name A, right? And it's a declaration, so we know there's going to be some location for that with a value in it. So the location's the box, the value's the circle. And this line is going to bind that name A to that location. So all that's done when we say int star A. Exactly. Okay. 
Yeah, and this is part of C semantics, right? There's really no way to say, well, I don't know, that's, I think, I'm pretty sure in C semantics there's no way to say, like, I just have something called A, so you declare an A without binding it to anything. Yeah, there's always, when you declare something, there's always something bound to that. Okay, and the other thing that the question specifically says is that, um, the address at wherever this is malloced, that the address of the location this returns is called one. We're just calling it. Um, okay, so we have our A, we have our B, so these are after these two uh, declarations. Now here, the semantics are malloc is going to create, think of it as a new location for us. So it creates a new box for us. And that box has a value associated with it. We don't have anything quite in it yet. Uh, but we know on the right-hand side that this, um, the address where this location is, it's called one. But, so this is a case where the malloc creates this, but there's no name bound to this, this, mem this location, right? We can't, right, I mean, if you just, like you could just say malloc stuff, yes. and there's, your program's creating locations in memory, right? But there's no way to access those and to get to those. Okay. So what is the result of doing this execution? So when we execute this, what are the semantics here? So the, is the value of... You can, you want, so you can like sit on my chair. No. Nope. The value of A is memory one. <laughs> right. Is it cool if I say that? Yes. Uh, we're, I'm recording though, so you should. Okay, there you go. <laughs> you just became a YouTube celebrity. Um, if you're not already, I, mean, I don't know your <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Okay, so malloc returns an R value, and the R value returned by malloc is the address of the location that it creates. Right, so it returns the value one, which is an R value. And the semantics here says when we have an L, so A is definitely an L value, right? Because there's a location associated with A. So the semantics of L value equals, is assigned an R value, is take the value from that R value and put it in the location that is associated with that L value. Put it in the value that is inside the location associated with that L value, right? So. Well, it's a long way of saying we have A, we, there's a location associated with A, and it has a value in there, so we copy the return value of malloc, which is the R value of 1, we copy that into the value that is in the location associated with A. What, what exactly does 1 represent? 1 represents an address. Okay, it's so a way of referring address. to a location. Look, it's like the memory block. So the memory block in the... Yes, exactly. So, yeah, so it's the, but it doesn't, so it's actually, if you read the C standard, it doesn't have to be, like, exactly memory addresses, like, the compiler could, or the, I don't know, it, they could have weird mappings, but in effect what it is, is this is the physical, like, the, I guess the virtual address, what the program thinks that address is, that's where that program, that, this lives, but we don't, we don't have to think about that, that's what the box circle diagrams are, is to show that it's actually, like, more abstract than, like, it doesn't, our, this thing could return negative numbers here, it could return positive numbers, it, could return, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't matter yeah. what it is. Are it could be symbolic. Are you going over the one that you just went over in class? Yes. The last one. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's after this execution. And then so after, yes, that, sorry. of course. Yeah, so yeah. can we consider then that the location associated with A is pointing to the other location? So here's the way I think about it. I think about where does, so this is the thing, is, is you want to kind of get these ideas of that A, even though A has type int star, all that is is just a location with a value in it. There's nothing special about int star versus int. And int is going to look exactly like this when you look at it with the memory. It's just a location that has a value associated with it. It's the value that defines the type, though, so... Uh, well, let's get there in a second. So, so you can, um, the question really kind of is, what is star A? 
right? That's where the question of pointers or pointing or dereferencing. So if you dereference A, right, so this, uh, the dereference takes in either an R value or an L value, uh, and it returns the location, like the L value that is the location associated with that. So if there's an L value in here, it says what in that value in there was the location that has that address. So we know here, so the way we can represent that is actually an arrow from the value, which is the circle, to the box. Location. Okay. Exactly. So this means that star A returns this box, that location. That makes sense. And this will come in handy in a second. Um, so then when we do this, oh, any other questions on this line? Okay, then we execute this line. So the malloc, what does the malloc do? Some number it creates. Yeah, it creates some location somewhere with some value. And we know its name is two. That's what the address is. Or it's not name, sorry, but its address is two. And then this assignment, so what does the assignment semantics do here? Value. Uh, so the value of the location associated with B, so we copy that R value, which is two, which is what malloc returns. We copy that into the value, which is inside the location associated with B. And so that's why we put two in there. So now in effect, right, to the box. star B is here. Questions on those two? You're you you referencing a pointer. Mm -hmm. Basically, two is the address. We are treating whatever's in the value associated with that. Yeah. We're treating that value as an address, and we're returning the location associated with that address. But the location is the address. No. The location is the box. The address oh, yeah, no, is yeah, metadata yeah, associated yeah, with it. Yeah. Right, exactly. So yeah, so dereferencing it is saying, OK, take whatever's in that value, look up that address, and return the location that has that address. So it returns the box. So that's why when we do something like here, right, at point one, when we say star A equals 42, so here we have, what's this, L value or R value? R value. R value? Wait, it returns the box or it returns the location? The, it uh, returns the box. Associated with the box. No, it return, the star returns the box. Okay. So specifically, the star always returns L value. Excuse me. So that's important for things like here, right? Because if it returns the value, right? So the semantics say we can have one of two things. We either have an L value is equal to an R value or an L value is equal to another one. Ah. Right? Those are the only two semantics we have. So if star A returned an R value, we wouldn't be able to use it on the left hand side here. And so this is why, because it's all consistent, because here we have an R value of 42, which is just the value 42. So we have these semantics here, L value is equal to R value. So this says copy whatever the value is associated with that R value, take that and copy it in.